so any idea whose feast day we're celebrating today? What does it say? John Paul II, yeah. Pope John, St. Pope, Pope, St. Pope John Paul II, Pope St. John Paul II. Anyway, yeah, um, not in the Ordo, uh, which is the, the book that we use that tells us why the feast is and stuff like that. So I guess it's still too new. So uh, let's take a moment now to praise God for his goodness, his mercy, and for giving us uh, examples, um, some from far long ago and some from uh, our own memories and our own lives. Uh, examples of discipleship that we can model our own lives after. So let's thank God for those and rest in God's mercy. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Let us pray. I pray that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, God may grant you that you may be strengthened in your inner strength, in your inner being, with power through his Spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the word of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, Praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, to deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive in famine. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Alleluia, 
to gain Jesus Christ and to be found in him. Disciples of Jesus, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So that doesn't sound like very good news, does it? No. <laughs> this, this Gospel needs some explanation because it's not nearly as intense as it sounds. Well, it is, but not in the way that you think. Because uh, you and I, when we think of fire, I don't know about you, I'm particularly afraid of, of fire getting out of control. Like, I'm really scrupulous about that. I have a, when I go to, my, to the lake, there's a, a, I have a fireplace. I'm really careful with that. And I don't clean out the ashes until I know that they've been dead for two or three days. Because, you know, I just have this thing, and I think most of us do. We know what fire can do. So this image that Jesus is using is, is particularly frightening. I came to bring fire to the earth. So what's he talking about? Well, remember, Jesus is a good Semite from 2,000 years ago. Think of Scripture. Think of the Old Testament. What other images of fire stick out in your head? Just think about that for a second. So you might think of maybe the most famous image from the Old Testament is what? Moses and the burning bush, right? So there's one. The other one that comes to my mind is the, the column of fire that led Israel out of Egypt. Remember through the Red Sea? Remember that big, huge column of fire? And then even in the New Testament, think of uh, Pentecost and the tongues of flame coming to rest on the disciples' heads. So, what, so fire is not... Jesus is not just talking about the destructive element of fire as such. He's talking about what it's like when God's presence is manifested. And, and so it, it's, like a, it's like a flame. It's like a fire. It's more about the energy that's there, and so that's what we're talking about. It's the uh, 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 kind of an image for the use, uh, used to sort of describe the energy that is there when God is present, when God manifests himself. So that's what we're talking about. So Jesus said, let me read it again so you hear it again. Jesus said to the disciples, I came to bring fire to the earth. Doesn't that make sense now? You think, I came to bring God's presence, God's abiding presence, the power of God's presence, the energy of God's presence, I've come to bring that to the earth. That's really good, because then now think about the imagery of, from Isaiah, the people who walked in darkness now have seen a great light. So this is actually a very hopeful thing. Jesus is saying, I've come to bring that light, that energy, so that people are no longer feeling like they're lost in darkness. So it's a very positive image, actually. And then... He says, I have a baptism with which to be baptized. What stress I'm under. Well, you know what he's talking about. In fact, that's what baptism, even our own baptism, is truly all about. I remember when I was at St. Timothy, they have that wonderful font of Timothy. It's probably the best feature of their church. Um, it's that font you can step into. And um, at Easter time, they fill up that, that middle section so that adults can be baptized. And I remember the first time I did a baptism there. Actually, that person comes to church here now. Uh, you, you know him. Um, so I baptized him as an adult. And I remember it was my first year, so I said to them, well, uh, so you remember Father Paul Campo, Father Paul Campo was the one who designed it with, with his parish, with his community at that time. So I said to them, well, what, is, what, is, what, did, what did Father Paul do with, with adults? Because you, if you kneel in it, it comes to about here. So what did he do? And they said, well, he, they would, he would go face, they'd go face forward. And I thought to myself, well, any movie that I've ever seen, 
um, of baptism in the Jordan, they're always going backwards into the water. So, so instead I had the person sit in the font, so legs out, and when it came time, and I was in the font with them, and I was getting all wet too, and I said, I said, okay, so it came time for the baptism, in the name of the Father, and I went backwards, dumped him backwards, and helped him down, and Father, said this for three times. Now, here's what's interesting. It blew me away that when he went into the water, because of the water itself and what water does to light, it refracts light. So here he is, backwards in the water, his eyes are closed, right? And he's not breathing, he's holding his breath, and he looks pale. He looks dead. That's what, it, that's what the imagery is for me. That sticks with me forever. So this guy was getting dunked back when he looked dead. And three times he gets dunked into that. So the imagery, it suddenly hit me what this means. That the imagery is that we're dying and rising with Christ. And that's what Christ is talking about. He's talking about his own resurrection. That's what baptism is, that he's got to go through. He's got to die so that he can rise to new life. And that's exactly what each and every one of us does. We die in Christ. He did the hard part. We do the, our little part. But that's really what that whole imagery is all about. So again, it's not, it's not, a, it's not the terrifying thing, the disturbing thing that we, that we think of initially when we first read this. I have a baptism with which to be baptized. Of what stress I'm under until it's completed. Of course, he was under stress. He knew what was going to happen. He knew how terrible it was going to be for him. And then he says this, and this is probably the most problematic of all. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, rather division. From now on, mother-in-laws are going to be trying to murder their daughters-in-law and vice versa. That's the image that we're left with when we read this. And it's really disturbing because isn't Jesus the Prince of Peace? Why, why is he saying that he's come to make us fight with each other? It's not what he's saying. It's a reality. He did, he did give us fair warning. He did say that if you follow the gospel, that you're going to upset the status quo. You're going to upset the status quo. And people, we've talked about this earlier this week, people don't like change. Despite the fact that that's all we know in life is change. You go to bed at night, you wake up in the morning, you've changed, right? You've got a new ache. There's a new spot that hurts. So we change constantly. You step into a river and you come back later, the river has changed. It's the same name, the same river, but I mean, it's changed. All the water's moved on and it's new water that's come in. And so everything changes and yet we resist change all the time. Well, he's saying if you follow the gospel, you're going to cause change. You're going to cause change in people's lives and they'll resent you for it. That's what he's talking about. So it's kind of, it's not that the disciples of Jesus are looking for fights. It's that just by merely following the gospel, people are going to get upset. They're going to be challenged. And some of them will fight you on it. Jesus gave us fair warning. He said that. He told us, if you follow me, some people are going to have a problem with that. Even sadly, it happens in families. Even sadly among friends. So that's, or even sadly, even in, in a church community it happens. So that's just a reality. It's a fair warning kind of a thing. But does that mean that we should, you know, avoid being followers of Jesus? No, you have no choice. Does it mean that you should say, okay, I'm going to abandon that because I've got to keep everybody happy? No, not really. In fact, if anything, is that really loving people? Is, it, is that really following the, the commandment to love? If you say, well, I'm going to compromise my values just so that you, can, you don't have to worry about being disturbed. No, in fact, probably the greatest love you could show for people is to be true to yourself and true to your calling, and true to what it is that you believe in and offer that for their salvation. Be a witness. The greatest love you and I can have for each other is to witness to each other what it is to be a disciple, to call each other to holiness and to sainthood. That's the biggest love we can have for each other. It's not always going to be a popular move. Not always. In fact, often it won't be. But it's the only thing we can do. And the thing is, is that he showed us that. He wasn't terribly popular with some people and it cost him his life. But that symbol became the symbol of, of the purest kind of love. That's what, that, that's what happened. And so that's what you're called to imitate. So you see, we're only talking about discipleship in all of this. It's just natural. It may be shocking or disturbing, the imagery that's used, 
But, I mean, again, as I said yesterday, that's what happens at this time of year. A lot of, of the scripture we're going to be seeing now is going to be trying to shock us, get us out of our doldrum, get us out of our dullness. That's what it's all about. So, and then, of course, it so happens, we happen to celebrate the Feast of St. John Paul II. Um, it's not in the Missal. It's not in the Ordo. It's that new. But think about it. We, we're so lucky to have the images of saints, real life saints. I remember, I even remember when he became Pope. Do you? I can tell you, it's like one of those things that, what were you doing that day? I was in a seminary in Kitchener, Ontario. I was studying for the Diocese of Hamilton. It was my first year. I was standing next to a guy. Now, I can't tell you what I had for breakfast this morning, but I remember this guy's name was Robert Givadona, and he was from Hamilton. I was standing next to him. His name was Givadoni, okay? So when the white smoke came and Pope and, and Carol Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II, came out, and it was clear to everybody that this guy was not an Italian, he was Polish. My friend Robert Givadoni screamed like like a girl, ah! like that, and he said, "Sorry, Robert, uh, there's probably a good chance you're not watching because we haven't talked to each other in 20, 30 years." But he screamed and he said. Is the world ready for this? Well, actually, that was a good question. Was the world ready for John Paul II? Think of what he did. I mean, the World Youth Movement, World Youth Day, he single-handedly made that happen. Well, single-handedly. Him and the grace of God, right? Him and the Holy Spirit. So, and he was terribly charismatic. And there were people, believe it or not, there were people that I know Actually, I know some, some priests who were really critical of him. And I thought, wow, how can you be, you know? I mean, he's human. He had faults like everybody else. But the stuff that he did because he believed in the gospel, because he, because he was a follower, an authentic follower of Jesus, the stuff that he did, you and I can only aspire to, to be that dedicated. But that's the point. We aspire. We have people like him and other great saints throughout all of history who have shown us, given us example of what to aspire to. So that's all the gospel is trying to do today. It's trying to rouse you up, to inspire you, and then with the Feast of St. John Paul II, we have somebody that we can aspire to in terms of imitating his discipleship, his following of Jesus. It's all good. See, it's all good. It really is good news. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth, work of human hands, and become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, will become our spiritual drink. and yours will be acceptable to God the Almighty Father.
Accept this sacrifice from your people, we pray, Lord God, and make what is offered for your glory, in honor of blessed St. John Paul II, a means for our eternal salvation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is fully right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. His death we celebrate in love. His resurrection we confess with living faith. And His coming in glory we await with unwavering hope. And so with all the angels and saints we praise you, as without end we claim, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you tell us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church, spread throughout the world and bring it to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Albert, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of glorious martyrs, St. Bernadette of Lourdes, St. Pope John Paul II, with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, that we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, I may praise and glorify you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, before my divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on my sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. You who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We offer each other a sign of peace in the form of a bow.
Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, for your death gave life to the world. Free me by this, your most holy body and blood, from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me always faithful to your commandments and never let me be part of you. Behold the Lamb of God, word made flesh and splendor of the Father, who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be. The body of Christ. 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 Shepherd has laid down his life for his sheep. Let us pray. May the sacrament we received, O oh Lord God, stir up in us that fire of charity which with, with which blessed St. John Paul II burnt ardently as he gave himself unceasingly for your church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.